the past two years, we've built a quite large React app. Now, uh, for the sake of example, let's say that this is a messaging app, which has uh, a bunch of modules that you'd expect from a messaging app, like uh, notifications, contact management, groups, etc. When we started working on this app, uh, there was only one team that worked on it. And that team uh, shipped features to production really fast. It moved really, really fast. But as time went by, more and more teams uh, joined and started uh, working on this app. And then uh, we've hit a problem. We, started, we stopped moving fast, and we kept breaking things. Now, uh, we had a lot of tests, so uh, that wasn't the problem, but uh, th things uh, still broke. So we set out to think, well, why is this happening to us? And we've identified several issues. One, it was really easy for us to create implicit dependencies. If we had two different components which rely on the same piece of state, uh, then you had an implicit dependency, which is bad. Also, it was really easy to break unrelated features, again, because of the implicit dependencies and because you could just import any service or any function and use it uh, in, a, in, in unintended ways, uh, and someone could, could change the service and then your code breaks. Uh, also, it was really hard to use different libraries or tools. Uh, let's say that your use case required a different uh, state management solution. It was really hard to do it. You had to sync two state management libraries, and it wasn't easy. And there was no clear ownership of shared code. For example, the logging code, monitoring code, bootstrapping, who owns that code and who manages it. It wasn't clear because each team only focused on their own features. Uh, so I've been doing software development for about nine years, and a lot of uh, that time I did backend development. And when we looked at the issues uh, that we faced with our app, we noticed that we've already encountered them, and we've already uh, solved them in another area in, in the backend development. So we can uh, see that uh, if you have a monolith application, like a lot of us had or, or even still have, uh, it, it looks quite similar to, uh, to a React app because you have a single application, a single process, which contains all the modules of your app, all the logic of your app. And again, this uh, monolith has the same issues because you can cr easily create implicit dependencies because uh, most of the time those monoliths used the same database for everything. So two different uh, pieces of code relying on the sa same table had, dif had an implicit dependency. And it was really easy to break unrelated features because, again, everything was a single process. You could just import any function and use it in unintended ways. Uh, it was really hard to use different libraries and tools. You couldn't use a different language because it was a single app, a single process. Uh, using a different data store was kind of hard. Using a different login library was hard. So you couldn't really use the right tool for your use case. Uh, and again, no clear ownership for shared code. So. All these uh, problems were solved uh, in backend development by microservices. Uh, uh, so what we did uh, in microservices, in microservices, we basically took modules, took logic outside of our main or our big monolith, and split them out to their own service, which is deployed independently and it has its own data store. And that gave us a lot of advantages because dependencies are now clear. If you want to use functionality which belongs to a different service, you have to make an API call which is explicit, and it, was really, it became harder to break unrelated features because when you change code inside your service, you know that it only affects your service. Uh, each service can be written in any language and it can use any data store because, again, uh, it only affects the, the, this service. And ownership became clear because each service was maintained by a single team and that team was also responsible for the infrastructure code of their service or their services. So we thought, well, let's apply the same. Let's try to apply the same principle in uh, in for React apps because uh, if the problems are the same, maybe the solution can be the same. So uh, we needed to answer a few questions uh, before we could uh, find an architecture that fits us. Uh, and those questions are: how, What exactly is a microservice in a React app? Because it's it's not a concept that is familiar. And once we identify what a microservice is how we're going to manage its state, and how we're going to share its state with the rest of the app. And again, who handles cross-cutting concerns like logging, monitoring, uh, routing, identity, etc. So I'm going to suggest the following architecture. Uh, this is a pretty simple architecture. We basically uh, divide our app into two layers. One is the service layer, which contains 
most of the logic and most of the code of the app, and the other is the corollary, which contains the infrastructure code. So let's dive into the services there. So we needed to think, again, what is a microservice in a React app? So we looked for something that is uh, kind of independent, kind of isolated, and the, the answer for us, at least, was to use NPM packages, because NPM packages are independent. Uh, their dependencies are clear, because you define them in, uh, in the manifest file, in the package.json file. You can use any tool you want inside the package. You can even build it in any uh, build system you want, as long as you transpile it to JavaScript. And it's, easy to, it's, it's really easy to change a package without baking other, other things, because, again, a package is uh, contained. So now that we know what, uh, what is a microservice for us, let's see how we're going to manage its state, and let's talk about state. We've identified two types of state uh, in our app. The first type is local state. But, and what I mean by local state is state that is logically owned and managed by a single package. It can be used by other packages, but its main usage is inside a single package. Uh, and you need to find a, a way how to expose this uh, piece of state to the rest of the app. So you can use uh, Redux reducers if you use Redux. You can use Mobix stores if you're using uh, Mobix. Uh, you need to take into account, though, that if, you're using, uh, you, if you choose to use Redux or Mobix to share state from a package, it means that your app needs to support this state management library. And it probably means that the other packages in your app need to use the same uh, state management solution. So you can go down that path, and it will even work pretty well. Uh, but for us, we really wanted to give uh, freedom to different teams to choose their own uh, tools and choose their own state management solution. So we decided to use Rx Observables, because Rx Observables, uh, they, don't, they don't require any other package uh, to use a specific state management solution. They just need to know how to consume observables. And I'm going to show an example for that in a second. Uh, the third point about state is that you need to remember to provide functions to alter the state. You don't want anyone just accessing your state and mutating it in any way that they want. You want to control the way that your state is being mutated. So let's see an example for exposing a uh, local state. Uh, we're using behavior subject from Rx. Now, I know maybe some of you aren't uh, familiar with Rx. So a behavior subject is basically an object which contains a piece of state, in this case, an empty object, and uh, it can expose this piece of state, and also it allows subscribi subscribing to future updates. So we create, in this case, uh, a list of contacts, which starts as an empty object, and we, pro sorry, we provide two functions which allow us to update this piece of state. So uh, in this example, we set an initial contact list uh, for the case where the app is being loaded for the first time. And we allow different parts of the app to add contacts. For example, if we we'll, uh, look at the messaging app, maybe we want to allow uh, sending a contact in a chat and just adding it to your contacts list. And the final part is exposing uh, your contacts as an observable to the rest of the app. So let's see how we're, we're going to consume uh, this piece of state. So let's say uh, we have a, a group uh, messaging feature. And we want to allow uh, to create a new group. So when you create a new group, you need to choose from your existing contacts. So the create group components uh, rely on contacts passed to it as a prop. And how are we going to pass it as a prop? Well, easily. We, we're going to just import the observable from the contacts package. And using a higher order component, which I won't go into because I don't have time, uh, we're going to inject the latest uh, value of the context observable into the context prop of the create group component. And every time this uh, list will change, our component will get updated as well. So the other part of uh, the, the other type of state is global state. Now, global state isn't really different from a local state. The only difference is it is logically uh, owned by no package, because uh, there isn't really a package that uh, is the sole uh, uh, owner of routing or the sole owner of identity, for example. So uh, the only difference is you need to uh, have the core layer of the app, which I'll go into in a second, maintain and manage it. Also, I highly recommend uh, keeping global state to a minimum, because once you have a piece of state that a lot of packages and a lot of components rely, it becomes really hard 
to change this piece of state, and it's a, it can be a source of uh, weird bugs. So we identified why, what is a microservice, and we talked about state. How are we going to handle cross-cutting concerns? Well, this is where we go into the core layer of the app. And basically, the core layer is just a simple React app, nothing fancy, which has uh, three jobs. One, it needs to import and mount our uh, microservices, our packages, our components. Two, uh, it needs to initialize the core services and to make them available for consumption by the packages. Uh, and three, again, it needs to manage the global state I mentioned earlier. So let's see a simple example. Um, we're importing two uh, pages, two uh, components from two different packages, one uh, the contacts page and one the groups page. We initialize two core services, uh, in this case, a logger and a configuration store. And by using React's context feature, we simply make those services available for consumption. Again, nothing here is really uh, complex. It's quite simple. It's just the concepts which are, which are new. So we've answered all our questions, but uh, there's still some open issues we need to take care of. One, we now have a lot of packages, so how are we going to manage those packages? Well, earlier today, Marcel gave a great talk about using monorepos, and I uh, highly recommend uh, watching it later if you didn't uh, attend it. But starting with a monorepo which contains all your packages and managing it with either Lerna or Yarn workspaces, Yarn workspaces uh, can make your life uh, easier. You can build everything together. You can control LinkedIn rules together. Uh, you don't have to deal with versioning if you don't want to, because you can always release from the latest uh, code of each package. And uh, if you want, you can go down the path of having uh, each package inside its own repo, but you'll need to manage versioning, and you'll, you'll need to manage uh, the build chain a lot of times. OK, so another question is, is how do we make sure relevant people review changes to a service? Because um, if we're using a monorepo, then anyone with permission to this repo can come and change your code, and you won't even know about it. So I think this is more of a process question other than a technical question. But you need to manage code ownership. Code ownership is really important. It's actually important even if you're not using this architecture, even if you're just using a normal React app. Um, it's really important that each piece of code will be maintained by, by someone who knows this code, who uh, has, a has some design goals for it, who keeps it in high quality. We are using uh, GitHub's code owners features uh, to do that, uh, which is working uh, great for us. But I'm sure there are other tools uh, and other ways to do it. As long as you do it, the, the tool doesn't really matter. And third, well, I talked a lot about uh, that the core layer needs to be owned. It, it, ne it needs to be managed by someone. So we have decided to dedicate a team to manage it. Even though this layer will probably be smaller than the services layer, it is really important. It needs to synchronize all the components together. It's need, it needs to handle a lot of important aspects, like uh, identity and routing. And if you're uh, using monorepo, someone needs to make sure that everything uh, is being built and deployed together. It has worked really well for us, and I highly recommend it. Um, so let's recap, because I see that you guys are all hungry. Uh, we've used packages and, uh, as microservices together with a small core layer to make us uh, go fast without breaking things when building an app using multiple teams. And another point I want to touch before I uh, finish is in order to uh, reach the, the state of the architecture that I showed earlier, we looked at uh, a different area. We looked at backend development, which isn't entirely related to React. Now, you'd be surprised how many similar problems exist between different areas. So I highly recommend looking around and seeing if you can learn from other areas. It worked really well for us, and I think it can work really well for you. Thank you.